Good evening, everyone. I trust that you are all keeping well, and I trust that uh, you are continuing to grow in your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. This evening, uh, we are going to turn our attention to Joshua again in our series, and we are in chapter 5 and verse 13, and we're going to go right through to the end of chapter 6. Joshua chapter 5, verse 13 to the end of chapter 6. So I can encourage you, if you've got a Bible, in whatever form that Bible comes, uh, to open it up, to read with me, and then to keep it open as we go through the passage a little later. Reading from verse 1. Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him, a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Now Jericho was tightly shut up because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I've delivered Jericho into your hands along with its king and fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of rams horns in the front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have all the people give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the people will go up every man straight in. So Joshua, son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, take up the ark of the covenant of the Lord and have seven priests carry trumpets in front of it. And he ordered the people, advance, march around the city with the armed guard going ahead of the ark of the Lord. When Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets before the Lord went forward blowing their trumpets and the ark of the Lord's covenant followed them. The armed guard marched ahead of the priests who blew the trumpets and the rear guard followed the ark. All this time the trumpets were sounding. But Joshua had commanded the people, Do not give a war cry, do not raise your voices, do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout. Then shout. So he had the ark of the Lord carried around the city, circling it once. <clears throat> then the people returned to the camp and spent the night there. Joshua got up early the next morning and the priests took the ark of the Lord. The seven priests carrying the seven trumpets went forward, marching before the ark of the Lord and blowing their trumpets. The armed men went ahead of them and the rear guard followed the ark of the Lord while the trumpets kept sounding. So on the second day they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. They did this for six days. On the seventh day, they got up a day at break and marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except on that day, they circled the city seven times. The seventh time around the city, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab, the prostitute, and all who are with her in her house shall be spared, because she hid the spies we sent. But keep away from the devoted things, so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise you will make the camp of Israelites liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and gold of the articles and bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. When the trumpet sounded, the people shouted. And at the sound of the trumpet, when the people gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So every man charged straight in and they took the city. They devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it, men and women, Young and old, cattle, 
sheep and donkeys. Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, Go into the prostitute's house and bring her out and all who belong to her in accordance with your oath to her. So the young men who had done the spying went in and brought out Rahab, her father and mother and brothers and all who belonged to her. They brought her out, entire family, and put them in a place outside the camp of Israel. Then they burned the whole city and everything in it, but they put the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron into the treasury of the Lord's house. But Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with her family and all who belonged to her because she had hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho, and she lives among the Israelites to this day. At that time, Joshua pronounced this solemn oath, Cursed before the Lord is the man who undertakes to rebuild the city Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn will he lay its foundations. At the cost of his youngest will he set up its gates. So the Lord was with Joshua and his fame spread throughout the land. This is God's word. Let's pray this evening. Our Father, when we read that account of how the people were able to defeat the city of Jericho, we are in amazement because not a hand was raised with weapons in it. Your people simply marched around the city and then the walls fell. We recognize and acknowledge your supernatural intervention. And we are humbled when we consider the power that you have in comparison to who we are and the little power that we have. You are a great God who is greatly to be praised. And this evening, we bow humbly before you and we open up ourselves to what you are going to say to us and pray, O oh God, that you would speak into the depths of our being. May you enable us to hear your voice this evening. Prevent us from closing up our ears. Prevent us from hardening our hearts. Prevent us from stubbornly refusing to hear what you have to say to us. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, take your word, your living word, and burn it deep upon our hearts, we pray, that it might leave an indelible imprint upon us. And as we hear your word this evening, may we also see something of the Lord Jesus Christ. For his sake we pray. Amen. One of the trilogies of movies that I have enjoyed, I must confess, is the movies about Back to the Future. Now, I know I'm dating myself. They go back to the uh, mid-80s and a little beyond that. But in the very first one, those of you who are familiar with the movies will remember that uh, Marty has got this car that he's in that is, in fact, being converted into a time machine. And he needs to go... Uh, back in time because he needs to be able to uh, go and warn his friend about some of the things that are going to happen that he's seen in the future. And he does go back in time in this machine, but then, of course, he's got to get back to the future. And one of these scenes, as he's driving in a drive-in, he's got to get to a certain speed before this machine transports him back into the future. And in order to get up to that speed, as he's driving, he's driving towards a wall. And he has to look beyond what he sees in front of him, because if he thinks only in terms of what he can see, then he's going to crash and he's going to end up in a mess. And he somehow has to have faith that when he reaches the speed, I think it's of 88 miles an hour, when he reaches that speed, that the machine is, is going to transport him into the future. And so as he drives and this wall comes closer and closer, he's got to constantly have faith that this is actually going to work and he's not going to smash up into this wall. And as he gets to the point of hitting the wall, the time machine springs into action and Marty is transported back into the past 
and then back into the future. And he has to have faith in that time machine to do what it's been designed to do at the speed of 88 miles per hour. When Joshua looks at this situation, it's an impossible task. There is a fortified city in front of him. There is a people who don't have a standing army. And now they've crossed the Jordan, but now they have to begin the invasion of the land. And the first thing that confronts them is a well-established, well-fortified city. And Joshua has to be able to look beyond what he can see in the human realm. And through the eyes of faith, he has to trust that when God reveals to him the plan that God has in order to take the city, that that plan is going to work. And in order for that to occur, Joshua needs to exercise faith in what God has revealed. And he needs to look beyond what he simply sees from a human perspective. Is that not true of you and I as believers? Sometimes it's so easy to get pressed down with what we see. It's so easy to become disillusioned and even depressed perhaps when circumstances seem to just come in upon us. And when we feel pressed down and the waves keep rolling in wave after wave after wave. And we look at some situations we are faced with and we think how on earth are we ever going to get out of this situation how are we going to manage in this particular set of circumstance? And in moments like those, we need to lift our eyes beyond what we see. And through the eyes of faith, we need to be able to trust in Yahweh, trust in God, trust in the Lord Jesus, to know whatever it is that we are confronting. Whether God brings an immediate solution to that or whether it is that God gives us the grace we need to persevere in those circumstances, that God is more than able to help us overcome what seemingly are odds that are impossible. Against all odds, God works a miracle. And this is what we would see as we go through this particular text this evening. Firstly, I want you to notice the reverence of faith. The reverence of faith. Look at verses 13 to 15. Now, for the sake of time, I'm not going to reread read all these verses. It would take too long. But verses 13 to 15, if you've got your Bible open, and I hope you have, you will read those verses and there's this strange, strange encounter carries Joshua walking down the road and suddenly there's a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword. And Joshua, in a sense, doesn't know what to make of this. Who is this man with the drawn sword? Well, we are told in the Bible it is an angel of God. But what kind of angel is it? Is it an ordinary angel that God has sent? Or is something more going on here in this encounter? I think when you read the text, it becomes very, very clear that this isn't just an ordinary angel that God has sent. This, in fact, is the angel of the Lord, the angel of Yahweh. This is a special angel, a pre-incarnate Christ, if you like, who is coming in the form of this angelic being who stands with his sword drawn. Why can we draw that kind of a conclusion? Well, I think there are a couple of reasons that uh, take us in that direction. The first is that this angel is spoken about of as being holy to God. And when the holiness is spoken about like that, it is generally a reference to God. The second reason is that Moses is told, uh, rather Joshua is told to take off his sandals. Why? Because he is on holy ground. 
Now that immediately casts you back to the encounter that Moses had with the angel of the Lord in the burning bush where God appeared to him and where Moses was instructed, take off your sandals because you are standing on holy ground. Joshua now has a similar kind of encounter and that immediately brings us or causes us to draw the conclusion that this must be something more than an ordinary angel. This is God appearing to, uh, to, to Joshua in the form of an angelic being, an angel of Yahweh. And the final reason is because Joshua bows down in reverential worship. Now we are told clearly in Scripture that the only person we are to worship is God and God alone. Even the angels in the book of Revelation when they are around the throne, are bowing down and worshipping the Lord Jesus Christ. They do not command worship. Angels are not to be worshipped. Only God is to be worshipped. So the fact that Joshua bows in reverence before this angel and worships is an indication that this angel is the angel of the Lord. Now, interestingly enough, Joshua's question then is, well, are you for us or are you against us? Now, what's interesting is the angel of the Lord doesn't answer him. At one level, you would think, well, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? If this is truly God, if this is the angel of the Lord in appearing, then surely he must be on the side of Israel's. And so Joshua's question almost becomes redundant. But I don't think that's the point that's being made here. I think there's a more subtle yet important point that is being made here. And that is that it's more important to know the person of God than it is to know what his plans are. See, for Joshua, it's not about getting insight into what God is going to purpose for them right now. That's going to come a little bit later. But right now, it is about worshipping who God is. It is about being in relationship to God. It's about knowing the very person, the very character of God. And that is more important than constantly busying God with questions about what his will is for my life. It's rather about revering God. It's rather about worshipping God. It's rather about being in relationship with God and basking, if I can put it like that, in his presence and just worshipping at his feet as Mary did and when she poured perfume on the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. Martha was busy preparing stuff in the house. Mary worshipped. Do you see, so often we get caught up in life, don't we, about wanting to know what God's will is for this matter and for that matter, what his plans and purposes are for us and in this thing and that thing, and we forget about just spending time at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ, worshipping him and being in relationship with him. It's so important to be rather than always to do. Faith submits in reverence to God. There's a great little story told about this. It's a true story. It's quite a moving story, actually, about a soldier in, this, in the First World War. Uh, the soldier asked his officer if he might go out into no man's land between the trenches in World War I to bring in one of his friends who lay grievously wounded out in this no man's land. You can go, said the officer, but it's not worth it. Your friend is probably dead and you will throw your own life away. But the man went anyway. Somehow he managed to get to his friend, hoist him onto his shoulder and Bring him back into the trench. The two of them tumbled in together and lay in the trench at the bottom. The officer looked very tenderly on the would-be rescuer and then said, I told you it wouldn't be worth it. Your friend is dead and you are mortally wounded. It was worth it though, 
sir, the soldier replied. What do you mean it was worth it? I'm telling you, your friend is dead and you are mortally wounded. Yes, sir, the boy answered. But it was worth it because when I got to him, he was still alive. And he said to me, Jim, I knew you'd come. You see, that relationship with that friend was more important than the safety of his own life. And even though it meant that he would lose his life as a result of that, that bond, that being there for that person was more important. And if I can say to you, Christian, it's more important that you are in relationship with Jesus, more important that you learn just to worship him and sit at his feet than you get about doing things for him and get busy about your life. It's more important for you to submit yourself to him in reverence, to bow humbly at his feet and to take in and to drink in who Jesus is and to be about wanting to know what he wants in this and that matter in your life. Secondly, I want you to notice the response of faith, verses 1 to 22. We don't have time again to read those verses. The response of faith. The text begins by reminding us of the impossibility of the situation. There's no way they can defeat the city. And the other interesting thing is that out of the cities in the land of Canaan, Jericho probably, from what we know, is the strongest of all the cities. In other words, if Israel can take Jericho, you can imagine what the rest of the inhabitants of the land are going to think if Jericho can't withstand them and Jericho is the most fortified and the strongest city. What hope is there for us? Israel is not equipped to defeat Jericho. After all, they've been wandering in the desert for 40 years. There's no standing army. There's no accumulation of weapons. They have no means of being able to engage in the battle. They have no chariots. And yet God is going to defeat the city because what he's going to do to these Israelites is he's going to say to them emphatically, it doesn't depend on you, it all depends upon me. Humanly speaking, it's impossible. But God's gift to Israel is the defeat of the city. It is God who battles on their behalf. And you see, what Israel needed to learn and they needed to understand is that whatever success they were going to enjoy and they were going to receive was always dependent upon God. It was always a gift of God. And so it wasn't going to come down to their ingenuity. It wasn't going to come down to their clever planning. It wasn't going to come down to them sitting down and their strategic planning of how they were going to accomplish victory in this battle. No, it was going to come down to God taking very weak instruments who in and of themselves had no chance and no way of invading the city and no way of defeating those people living inside the confines of the city. But it was God who was going to act on their behalf and take weak instruments and raise them up and use them and thrust them out and achieve great things through them. And it's so very important to get that lesson. God was battling on their behalf. God was going to do what they could not do. And they needed to learn to trust him and to uh, rely upon him and to allow him to do the work in and through them so that he could accomplish great things. And that meant, you see, they had to respond in faith. And their response in faith was to get up and to march around that city understanding that the marching around the city is innocuous as it seemed, as inconsequential as it may have looked, even to the people in the city who might have thought, what's on earth is going on here? What are these people doing marching around the city? That's not going to accomplish anything. That God was going to give them a victory that would remind them that he was stronger than any enemy that they would encounter in the land of Canaan. And they needed to know that because there were many more battles to fight. 
They are weak instruments. But God is a great God. And therein lies the key to ministry success, does it not? You see, so often you and I get caught up about how unable we are to do things. It's so easy to look at the people who are really gifted and who are strongly gifted in in certain areas and, and we compare ourselves to them and we think, I could never do that. I could never accomplish that. I could never be that kind of person or have that kind of upfront ministry or have that kind of charismatic personality, whatever the case may be, or be that great preacher out there uh, like a, a Spurgeon or a Martin Lloyd Jones and, and and we compare ourselves and you think there's just no hope for me and God comes back to us and says but it's not about how weak you are it's not about your inabilities it's about me coming upon you and me strengthening you and me enabling you and me working in and through you and you drawing upon my supernatural power and then watch what I can do through weak instruments is that not Paul who says God delights in the weak things of the world Paul in uh, 2 Corinthians 11 verse 30 says if I must boast I will boast about the things that show my weakness And in 1 Corinthians 1, in chapter 2, he talks about the fact that God delights in weakness, that God loves to raise up those things that are weak in the world because when God takes weak instruments and he accomplishes great things to them, what happens? I'll tell you what happens. Only God gets the glory. Because everyone turns around and they look at that person and they stand in amazement that God could take someone so weak like that and raise them up and accomplish so many great things through them. God doesn't work like this world. We look for strength. We look for confidence. We look for giftedness. We look for those who stand out in the crowd, those who stick out. And God says, I'm not interested. I want those people who don't stand out, those people who seemingly are passed over for for the more powerful, and I will take them and raise them up. But there's a catch. And the catch is that those weak instruments need to respond in faith. It's not just a matter of sitting back and saying, well, there I am, I'm weak, what can God do? No, these people needed to respond. They needed to realize that when Joshua said, get up and march around that city with the Ark of the Covenant being carried by the priest going before you, symbolizing the presence of the Lord, that you needed to march. And even if you thought that nothing was being accomplished by your marching, day after day for seven days, they needed to march around that city on the seventh day they needed to do it seven times and then at the end of that seventh time they needed in one voice to shout and God would bring the victory now from a human perspective that seemed ludicrous you go to a nation and say the way you defeat that nation is you just march around that city When you're attacking Stalingrad, don't worry about bringing your planes and your cannons and your tanks. Just march around the city and watch what God is going to do. It's it's almost, when we look at it, ludicrous from a human perspective. And yet, there was an immediate response of faith. Immediately they obeyed. Immediately they appropriated the promise that God gave that victory would come. There was no hesitation. There was no holding back. There was no second guessing. There was no going to Joshua and saying, Joshua, your plan stinks. It's not going to work. No, there was a submission to God. There was an immediate response of faith. Faith does not question God's word. Faith does not question God's power. Faith simply submits. Faith simply believes. Faith simply appropriates. And then it moves. 
It's never passive. It trusts and acts on what God has said. And then it waits to see the great things that God will accomplish. That wonderful story told about a, a pump in America. It's a very good story. A foreign following, following letter was found in a baking powder can wired to the handle of an old pump that offered the only hope of drinking water on a very long and seldom used trail across Nevada's Amagosa Desert. This pump is all right as of June 1932. I put a new sucker washer in it and it ought to last five years. But the washer dries out and the pump has got to be primed. Under the white rock, I buried a bottle of water out of the sun and cork end up. There's enough water in it to prime the pump, but not if you drink some first. Pour about one-fourth and let her soak to wet the leather. Then pour in the rest medium fast and pump like crazy. You'll get water. The well has never run dry. Have faith. When you get watered up, fill the bottle and put it back like you found it for the next person. Signed, Desert Pete. P.S. Don't go drinking the water first. Prime the pump with it and you'll get all you can hold. That requires an act of faith. You can't simply get that bottle and think to yourself, I'm thirsty, I'm desperate, I need a drink. Let me have a quick sip of water because you won't have enough water to prime the pump. It requires an act of faith when your mouth is dry and parched to take that bottle and to pour that water over that pump and to prime it in order for it to bring water. In the same way, my dear friends, God requires that you and I respond in faith to the promises of his word. And when God moves us and when God calls us and when God makes clear for us in his word what we ought to be doing, then it is by faith that we submit in reverent obedience to what he has called us to do. God's word is to be obeyed. God's promises are to be appropriated. And when God tells us to do something and when God commands us to obey him and when God calls us to live in reverent submission to him and to submit our lives to the Lordship of Christ, then you and I must respond in obedience. There should be no questioning of God. When God calls you to pray and commands you to pray, then pray in faith. When God calls you and moves in you by the power of the Spirit and confirms it in his word that you are to engage in a particular ministry area, then respond in faith. If God calls you to be a pastor, if God calls you to be a missionary, and he makes that clear from his word, then it's not about whether or not you are able, capable. It means that you respond in obedience, in faith. You appropriate that. When God calls you to live an ethically pleasing life to him and he calls you not to be immoral and he commands you to live a life that is pleasing to him, then you don't question God when temptation comes knocking at your, wall, your door and the devil whispers in your ear, did God really say? You obey, you believe his word. When God says that you are tested, be, you are receiving a temptation and that temptation is not going to stretch you beyond what you can bear, but God will provide a way that you might bear up under it, then you appropriate that. When God calls you young man, young woman, and he says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Then you trust in that promise. You trust in that word. And you don't allow yourself to get drawn in to entering into a relationship with an unbeliever because there are no believers around at this point in time. 
You believe God and you trust that God in the right time will bring along the right person who is also a believer that you might enter into a relationship with them. When God says to you, if you confess your sins, I am faithful and just to forgive you of your sins, then don't revisit those things which God has forgiven you for. Trust that that forgiveness is sure. When God says to you, my grace is sufficient for you, my power is perfect in weakness, then don't doubt God's promise to you. Trust him, appropriate him. Faith always requires a response. And then thirdly, I want you to see the reward of faith. Verse 17b, verses 22 to 23, verse 25. This is the victory over the city. It is significant, as I've already said, and I won't revisit this in any length because Jericho is the strongest city. Here is the raw reward that they can enjoy the victory that God has given them, that they receive the blessing of the defeat of Jericho, that they have their first victory in the land, that they can see the reality of God's promises already being enacted by God through the victory that God has achieved through them. That's the blessing of faith that is appropriated. That's the blessing, that's the reward of when we truly trust God and what he said in his word. Remember the woman and the story of Elijah when he comes to this woman who's got her last bit of flour and that she's going to bake some bread and her and her son are going to die and Elijah says first bake some for me and she says this is all I've got and Elijah says doesn't matter bake it for me and uh, she said this is the I've got nothing left and she obeys and she bakes bread and she uses the oil and God provides oil and bread for her until Elijah leaves the land until the famine is over. The reward of faith. It seemed impossible. How could she do this when all she had was enough left to bake for her and her son and then they were going to die? Elijah says, first do it for me. And as she believed and as she trusted and as she put her faith, not in Elijah, but in God's ability to produce, God rewarded her faith. Moreover, I want you to see, in the midst of destruction, there is the beacon of hope. Why? Because in the moment those walls come down, there is a family, an entire family God has saved. Rahab has exercised faith. She has believed. She has appropriated salvation. She has trusted in God and she has become part of that covenant community and so the promise that God gave to her that her life would be spared she needed to put that red flag that red ribbon in her in the wall so they knew where she was that she would be saved and now Joshua says make sure that when you go into the city now that the walls are down that you spare Rahab you spare her whole family in the midst of this there is this incredible reward of faith to Rahab and her family because she trusted Yahweh. She became part of this covenant people. And therein lies an incredible lesson, is there not? Because therein lies a reminder to all of us that if we are willing to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, there is hope. There is hope in the midst of despair because we are told that one day God is going to require an accounting from all people and one day we are all going to stand before God and one day God is going to demand of us what we have done with the Lord Jesus Christ. And for all those who have put their faith in him, for all those who have repented, for all those who have turned away from their sin, there is the reward of spending eternity in heaven. What is the opposite of that? The opposite of that is the rejection of faith. 
And we see that in verses 24, verses 26 and 27. We see an entire city that rejects God, an entire city that rebels against him, an entire city that's been living in sin. And when you hear God's words to Joshua, go in there and destroy everything, destroy the men, destroy the women, destroy the children, destroy the cattle, destroy the, the sheep, don't allow the city to be rebuilt, flatten everything. Our modern sensibilities may seem at first hearing a little bit horrified by that but I want you to remember the context this is not an innocent city this is not a city that God has not given time to repent how do I know that because in Genesis chapter 15 verse 16 look it up when God speaks to Abraham, he says to him, when he takes him back to Egypt, he says, I'm going to bring you back to Canaan. It's going to take 400 years before you get back here. But in that 400 years, the sin of the Amorites who possess that land is going to have reached its fullness. And as a result of 400 years of rebellion against God, 400 years of sinning against God, 400 years of rejection against God, God is eventually going to call that land to account. And all those inhabitants in that land are going to stand and answer before God. And God is going to bring his hand of judgment against them. They've had 400 years to repent. Again and again, they have chosen to rebel. And I want you to see something else here that's so, so very important. And Pastor Nathan will pick up on this, I'm sure, in the sermon next week. So I'm not going to say too much about this. But notice the collective nature of sin. Sin is never something individual. Why? Because generation after generation after generation passed down their rebellion. So that each successive generation followed in the footsteps of their parents and they too sinned. And so that the sin of the earlier generations accumulated to the successive generations and to their generations and to their generations until it finally came to a head and God said, enough. And the instruments of God's judgment to bear upon Jericho and the sin of the land of the Canaanites was that Israel would come and all the people would be slaughtered. We have to understand that that is God's judgment against persistent, ongoing rebellion and rejection of him. And that lesson that we see there is meant to remind us, is meant for us to see that whatever destruction they experience and the judgment of God that eventually fell upon them is pointing us forward to a much greater judgment in the future. For God has set a time when he will call every single person to account and we will stand before the judgment seat of God and God will open the books and all whose names are not written in the book of life will be sent to everlasting hell where they will experience the everlasting wrath of God against them. That will be the just penalty for their sin we must understand this dear friends you have to see that God is not going to simply turn a blind eye to the rebellion of those who reject his son the Lord Jesus Christ there is a day coming when God will call us to account and every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess and God has set that day in the future where his wrath will be poured out and his judgment sword will fall upon all those who have continued to reject him and rebel against him. God will not allow us. He cannot allow us to get away with our sin forever. For God is a holy God. God. 
And God's holiness must burn against sin. God's holiness and sin cannot coexist. And God's wrath, God's justice must be satisfied. And it is satisfied. It's satisfied in himself. For God appeases his own wrath. How does he do that? He appeases his own wrath by sending his own son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who comes into the world as God's only begotten son and then on the cross bears the full measure of the wrath of God, of the judgment of God against your and my sin so that we don't have to experience it one day in eternity. So that all those who turn to God in faith and repentance and trust in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, God takes their sin, which has been imputed unto Christ, and he judges their sin when he pours his wrath upon his own son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so his wrath is appeased, his justice he's, is satisfied. And thus for those who come and bow before the throne of God and turn away from their sin and fall at his feet and cry out for mercy from God, are able to know with absolute certainty that they will not experience the everlasting wrath of God one day because Jesus Christ has borne it on their behalf. But those who continue to rebel against God, who continue to turn away from him, who continue to reject him, who continue to lift their fist in his face and say, I will not bow, one day they will. And if they don't repent now, they are going to bring upon themselves through their own volition, through their own decision, through their own rebellion, they are going to bring upon themselves the eternal judgment of God. And they will have no one else to blame but themselves. For when they languish in hell and when they experience God's wrath being poured about, out upon them, it will because, be because they have repeatedly rejected God's grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. They will be there by their own choice. And they will be there as the just punishment for their rebellion against God. So can I urge you, can I say to you, if that's you tonight, if you are like those people in Jericho, you've hardened your heart, you've stubbornly refused to repent, you are living in rebellion to God. Don't be like them. Be like Rahab, who reached out and who said, yes, please, I don't want to perish with the people of Jericho. I know it's going to happen. And she appropriated salvation by turning away from us and by trusting in Christ and receiving eternal life. And she became part of the covenant family of God. God reaches out to you and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, O sinner. And he says, why will you not turn? Why will you perish in your sins? I sent my son so you don't have to. Can I encourage you? Don't, don't leave this live stream until you've got hold of someone. Contact the church. We would love to speak to you. One of the pastors will speak to you. Email us. But don't let this matter rest until you know that you're right with God lest you experience the same devastating judgment that the inhabitants of Jericho and then the land of Canaan received because of their rebellion. Be a Rahab, trust in Christ, turn to him in faith and repentance and receive life. Amen. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of your word. I want to pray particularly for those who don't know you. You know them, Lord. 
Some of them have been living in rebellion for a long time. They've rejected you. They've turned away from you. They've heard your voice call out to them again and again and again. And each time perhaps that voice is becoming a little bit more distant. Oh God, I can't save anyone. Thank goodness for that. But you can. You are the God of salvation. And so I pray through the power of the Holy Spirit, take your word and drive it home with such force into the hearts of those who don't know you that they can and would only inevitably respond in faith and repentance. Draw them to yourself, I pray. And for the others of us, Lord, who do know you, may you encourage them to know that you are a great and powerful God who is able to accomplish what seemingly in their lives is impossible. Help them to learn to trust you in faith and obedience. For Jesus' sake, amen. God bless you.